girl, she was pregnant with them. We yeah. got there and she goes, did you come for the ball game? Oh, this is and great. Said, yes, we left at halftime and it's... 57 nothing. Yeah, 57 or whatever, 54 whatever. She goes, better luck next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's our opening jokes anyway. Let's let's start off with a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for worldview. And thank you for um, just giving us the opportunity to kind of work through this and just kind of see what it is that you're doing in our life and in the life of our culture and in our life of our church. I'm just going to ask right now that as we wrestle through these things, um, that your Holy Spirit would lead us gently and no matter where it is that we are that you would always bring us closer to your word. These things we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Um, we had, I had started this, oh, uh, kind of done an introduction on this uh, two, maybe two weeks ago. Um, Labor Day, Labor Day Sunday, we were pretty small in Sunday school. And I was like, hey, we're just going to do something different. So I wanted to do a real quick run through of this. Uh, there are four basic questions that we as people ask in life. Uh, they usually end up being something very close to this. Where do we come from? Where am I going? Number three is a little bit different in the fact that the question is, is what do I do with my guilt? And number four is what is my purpose? Uh, when we're thinking about a biblical worldview and a secular worldview, on any of these things, we can find ourselves along this line, along this spectrum. I want to call this, a, I don't know how else to call it, this a spectrum. And I'm going to start by telling a little bit about where I've come from. And that is, I wanted to say growing up in church, I probably grew up in this area. Yeah, so I think I had a biblical worldview. And as I kept going through school, I found myself crossing this middle point and coming into what I would call a secular worldview. Now, here's a secular worldview. Question number one, where do we come from? What does the Bible teach? Where do we come from? What, is, what do we understand through Scripture? God created us. Okay, creation. Yeah. And what does our world say on where do we come from? Evolution. I want to define some of these terms uh, a little bit. We're going to have creation on that side. Evolution is on this side. Another thing that we will see, or that you will see, especially right now in academia, is this. It's called NDP, which is Neo-Darwinistic Theory, uh, which is evolution-ish. <laughs> It's like, we understand evolution has problems, and so we're going to reduce it now to what's called neo-Darwinism theory, which is evolution, I guess, 2.0. Where am I going? Uh, this where am I going question uh, is really kind of interesting. I was watching Ken Ham take Bill Nye the Science Guy through the Ark Encounter. And for an hour and 40-some minutes, Bill and Ken argued this question, where am I going? <laughs> Bill and I basically says that when we die, we cease to exist. And that somehow, because we cease to exist, um, the only thing that we can contribute to the betterment of the world is our DNA and leaving something for the next generation. Because after we die and we cease to exist, we'd have, the, at this point in time, Ken Ham asked him, so, you have, so we have no recollection that we ever existed? And Bill said, no, we have no recollection that we ever existed because at this point in time, we don't exist. That's a pretty unique side of this whole thing of where am I going. On the other side, in a biblical worldview, 
we have this idea called eternity, that somehow we get to spend forever one place or another. Um, where am I going? What do I do with my guilt? <laughs> what do I do with my guilt? Have you ever thought about this? How does somebody with a secular worldview deal with their guilt? Well, denial. <laughs> yeah. Oh, come on, Larry. Get your fingers working. What guilt? Drugs. Everything's permissible. Drugs, alcohol. Yeah. I, you know, and, and there's a lot of escapism in this. Uh, one of the things that I'm observing, and, and I think that we will continue to observe, is the increase of medicating our guilt away. Whether it's through alcohol, whether it's through lifestyle, whether it's right now... Uh, there is a big thing going through here with, with marijuana in our culture that we finally said, okay, you need to medicate yourself. Here's this. Question on the, on the Bible side, what do I do with my guilt? Is that I can find forgiveness. That somehow the blood of Jesus Christ that God has already taken my guilt into consideration and has provided a way out of it. Last question, what is my purpose? What's my purpose? Remember what Jesus said? I came to what? Seeking to save the lost. That you might have life and have it abundantly. Yeah. But he also came to serve, right? And so... We see in the New Testament that Jesus did not consider equality something big, big grasp, but he but he subjected himself to this and became humble, even and submitted himself even to death on a cross. On the worldview side, what is my purpose? Well, it's self-defined. <laughs> all about me. <laughs> Have you seen narcissism in our world? Just a question. What does narcissism in our world today look like? Like it's all about me. <laughs> it's all about where I'm headed and how I need to get there. Yeah. Yeah. I've dealt with someone who's like that. There's no change in their mind or convincing them Yes. Yeah. I mean, that your concept of being different, of not being that way, is so obsolete to them, they can't even grasp it. It is. Yeah. I mean, if it's a real true, yeah. Yeah. Or someone I deal with, if that's what they've been diagnosed with, and they just, they just look at you like you're an alien. Yeah. And so if you think about all of this side to the extreme and all of this side to the extreme and you're trying to put yourself on this line, where would you put yourself today? Question number one. As you ponder that, um, I want to make sure that I do this well. I'm going to ask a question and you give me some answers. Um, I'm going to point to a spot on the line. Here's the question. At where at on the line can a person be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ? Follow me? Am I making sense? So if I'm right here, can I be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ? Yes. Yeah? What about if I'm right here? What do you think? Can you be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You can be. Okay, what about here? You can be saved. You're saying can be. It is possible. Okay. Follow me? When we encounter Christ, 
It doesn't matter where we are on this line. Okay? There's a salvation event. Okay? Um, I would like to say this about my life. Um, is that I was probably... See how close to the middle I'm getting? I was probably here when I was saved. Okay? Just personal experience. It's probably there when I was saved. I went from here. Oh, let's just draw there. Let's just say I got here. I know that I'm on this side of the line with a secular worldview. Here's the question Am I still saved? Think? Okay. What I've discovered in my life in the last, oh, probably seven to ten years is that I find myself going back this way. Okay. Now, here's why I want to take, take, take a look at this idea of biblical worldview is because this is not a salvation issue. A lot of times we in church have taught that this is a salvation issue. And I don't know that it is a salvation issue. Anthony Hopkins recently, within the last two or three months, uh, has become a Christian after dealing with years of alcoholism. Just a short little article about Anthony Hopkins Here's the thing. Do you think he's probably over here where he started? <laughs> probably not. Probably a lot more this way. And here's the thing about this, this idea about it, it being a salvation issue is I believe even as I'm going this way in my early life, early adult life, that I'm still saved and I still understand that this is what the Bible teaches I just don't know that this was something that I could defend or understand. And when I started to, I'm trying to think, oh my goodness, this is now a salvation issue and it's not. Okay? I think that's the biggest thing is that no matter who we encounter on this spectrum up here, that they can be saved at any point in time and it really has nothing to do with their worldview when they encounter Christ. Follow what I'm trying to say? Make sense so far? Here's where I come down to on this, is that I have difficulty comprehending my Bible the further <clears throat> down this side that I am, the less relevant this thing becomes. Is that a fair statement? You follow what I'm trying to argue with? Okay. So I want you to think about somebody who may be on one side or the other of this issue. And tell me what hang-ups they might have about Scripture. Follow what I'm asking? If somebody's over here, what hang-ups do they what hang-ups might they have about Scripture? Because I guarantee you probably had conversations. People all along the spectrum. How do, you, how do you know it's true or how do you know it's just not a made up story? Like yeah. Like, how do you know it's. it's yeah. Okay. Drinking, I see them out doing this, I see them doing that. And so, you know, I don't want to 
go to church with people like that. So this is, and this is kind of, I won't spend a, a second or two. This is kind of relevant that we sat with some people in the um, football game Friday night, and I knew the two ladies, but Larry had never seen them or met them. And I've known the one lady for years, and I introduced, but he was, of course, over here, and I'm talking, and I was telling him on the way home, the lady sat, was talking to him at the casino, and then she apologized to me. And I said, why did you, why are you sorry? I wasn't connecting A and B, I guess. And she said, "Because he's pastor." So we've been to the casino. She goes, "Oh, so maybe not that she was saying we're hypocrites, but there will be some people that would say because we've been there that that's the wrong thing to do." So, right? Is that what you're? Okay. Make sure you shake your head. Okay. Or for me, I'm like, it's just a choice. We, I mean, do we go there every day of the week? No, but we have been out there since it opened once. She was just like. Yep. Maybe that we're taught that God loves us, but people think we have a belief that bad things don't happen from somebody who loves you. Okay. So if bad things happen and you think, oh, well, God loves me. Why, why did that happen? Yeah. Okay. Not, that, not bad things happening to good people, but more of bad things happening from somebody who loves you. Okay. What does this guy over here, as he looks on this side of the line, what does he see? Sinners. <laughs> or judgment, or is that what you mean? How bad they are? Yeah. I'm just asking, what does he see? Worldview. How, yeah, I was going to say how bad they are. Oh. <laughs> uh. I don't know how else yeah. to do it. <laughs> oh my goodness! You're so going to hell, and I'm so glad I'm not. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Because this is this is in our culture. This is typically how we have this interchange with worldviews, and it you see how if if one side sees the other as hypocritical, and this side sees the, this other side as you're complete pagans, we have nothing in common. What is happening here in this conversation? Nothing. Nothing but conflict. Yeah, oh, yeah. And there is no agreement. Okay. On this side of the worldview equation, judgment should be normal. Follow me? Yeah. On which side? From this side of the, of the world views, looking that way, judgment should be normal. In fact, it is so normal when you take a look at our culture wars. There's just, oh, you're so bad. Oh, you're so evil. Oh, I can't believe you do this. Oh, my goodness. We need to take everything from you because you just can't be trusted with it at all because we are over here judgmental. <clears throat> Fair statement? You're chewing on something. Maybe. Okay, you don't want to think that way. No, I do. That's I'm why just... I don't like the workplace. I'm sorry. Okay. I mean, I've shared that with you that we, why we have to be so judgmental. Why can't you just keep your mouth shut and not say anything about the other person? Why does it really matter? <laughs> because. I'm sorry. But this is. That's their world. I don't get it. This is the world. Get, I don't get caught up on whatever else. Right. Why does, why does everybody right. have to do that? Does anybody understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Oh, you're oh you're oh you're one of those. <laughs> but I mean, they judge everything. I'm not just they saying do. morals. They judge what the other person does, their job performance, their blah 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 blah. It's, it's all. Yeah. What happens when we take this same judgment and look over here? Is this applicable? You see where the word, uh, holy cow, you're going to hell. <laughs> just stay away from them. It, it, Here's a question. With a biblical worldview, how is this person supposed to see this side? With what attitude? Just with Humility. Grace, with mercy, with just... Compassion. Com yeah, they're just people.
Now then, I'm going to try to make this case, okay? And the case is the further you go down in this, the more probably mature you're moving. If you're over here and you find Jesus, hypocritical is pretty easy to spot. If you're over here and you see pagans, oh my goodness, I need to stay away. <laughs> I've seen it in the church. I've seen it with family members who've gone to church together. Oh, you just go, oh, oh, oh. But here's the thing. As you move further this way and you move further down this idea, compassion, they change from pagans to people. Is that a fair statement with our worldview? Yeah. And so here's the case that I want to make because we're getting into... We're just laying out, just still laying out evidences, still laying out how it is that we grow, how it is that we move, how it is that we process this whole crazy thing called worldview. Is that in my in my growth, and as I and as I talk with other people who've gone back and forth of this center line, and I want to say that this center line is. creation. It is the Genesis 1 account of how it is that we came to be. Here's the thing that I've understood is that even when I'm on this side of, the, of this line in this worldview, I would have difficulty rectifying Genesis 1-1 and dealing with creation as something that I could believe. Because I was told, oh, it's a story. Oh, it's evolution or neo-Darwinistic theory. <laughs> and here's what I've also seen is that once I'm able to get into creation, I'm able to quit judging, coming this way. And the further that I go into a biblical worldview, the less they become pagans and the more they become people in that previous illustration. Now, here's the thing. Salvation is still a part of our growth experience and still a part of this Christian experience. And I'm going to be very careful to say it this way. Creation, I believe, is not a salvation issue, but there are friends that I have that believe that it is. And if you don't believe in a six-day created earth 6,000 years ago, you're a pagan. <laughs> it's like, I, I can't quite get there. Now, here's, my, here's what I want to leave us with is that I don't care where you're at on the spectrum. And I don't care at the end of this time what you think about creation. My only goal is to try to get you on a road from here that will take you that way. And here's what I've discovered. The people that I've talked with that go this way, my own experience that goes this way, it didn't unlock until I started getting a firm grasp of the creation doctrine. Make sense? So I want to challenge us tonight to be, to be thinking about some different things. With all of this, um, man, I really need to deal with this. Let me erase. Eh, I got plenty of room here. We're going to be dealing with philosophy. We're going to deal with biology, cosmology, geology, astronomy, mathematics, and all this other thing. Let me see if I can do worldview. Here's our guy. He's got a question mark. <laughs> He's thinking about stuff. Either that or he has really bad hair. Okay. I don't know. How do I apply observational evidences of the world around me
How do I apply observational evidence in the world around me to better understand the universe that I find myself in? Have you ever worried about that? <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> but here's the question. We do this every day, knowing or not knowing it. Follow what I'm, asking, follow what I'm saying? How do I apply observational evidence in the world around me to better understand the universe that I find myself in? Now, worldview, every one of us has a belief. I don't know what else to do. This is, hopefully this will keep simple math, okay? We have belief and we have evidences. Question number one, which is greater, belief or evidences? It's a deep philosophical question. Feel like if you believe something, you're gonna hold on to it harder and stronger versus someone else giving you evidence to the contrary. It's going to take a whole lot of evidence to ever break that belief. Mm -hmm. to me. I think you're right. Every encounter that I've had, this is my anecdote. I can't, I can't, I don't have a great mathematical proof. I don't have a great logical proof, but I have great anecdotal proof. Exactly <laughs> what you're saying. I can believe something contrary to the evidence. I can tell you that the Baltimore Orioles are the best baseball team on the planet. If you follow baseball, you'd say your evidence is pretty weak. They can't hardly spell baseball. I mean, you know what I'm saying. So here's what I find at work. Belief is greater than evidence. Unless... Evidence, okay, let's see if I can do this wrong. This is the best equation that I can come up with, <laughs> okay? I will take evidence and I will judge it for or against my belief if I have a possibility of changing my belief. Now here's the thing, is that this N is the unknown thing in every one of us. Here's the, it's the question is, am I wrestling with any of these four questions? Am I really wrestling with what I'm seeing around me? Because evidence doesn't always change our belief. Follow what I'm trying to say? This is... This is the most simplest, and, and here it is. Hopefully, we're done with math for the night. <laughs> okay. So my only mathematical thing that I can come up with um, is exactly right. My belief is greater than any evidence that you can give me because I'm not going to change my belief, even if I have tons of evidence. And this over here is what I call, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. I don't, know how, I don't know what else to call it, but it's just what I call it. The, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. Now, here's the thing. How many of us saw that demonstration with the O.J. Simpson trial, right? We saw that. How many of us believe that he's still guilty? <laughs> still believe that he's guilty, right? But if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. Gave just enough. Oh, I have to change my belief system now, don't I? But we don't. We don't. And we can argue that whole, we can argue that whole um, argument uh, for a whole long time. But uh, here is let me go here. Ooh, it's 7.30. If you got your Bible, let's go to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Now 
Genesis 1-1 is the one verse that I know in Hebrew <coughs> by heart. Bereshit bara Elohim et ha shemayim va'et ha'eretz. Which is, in the beginning created God, the heavens, the earth. Now, when I get ready to lay this out, Vicki, if you walk out of here, say, hmm, I want you to chew on this. I don't know if anybody else will get it. <laughs> I figured you might appreciate this. In the Hebrew, the first two words are bereshit bara. This is where God created, in the beginning, created God. I'm going to make a case that the enemy likes to play off of whatever God is doing. And so the contrary story is the Big Bang. Article I read, these two letters were picked to start this alliterative thing because on the other side, the letter B was repeated. I don't know if it's true. Don't know if it's true, but it certainly is interesting that that's a thing that we're dealing with. So in the beginning, <clears throat> let's think about in the beginning, what was before beginning? Let's do some armchair philosophy for just a few moments. In the... <laughs> <laughs> oh, golly, Roger, that's class. I don't know. He said in the... What, was oh, what is before beginning? <laughs> what is before beginning? I in love the. that. It is in the... Yes, that is accurate. <laughs> oh. Oh, golly. I'm sorry, that's, that's just too good. So God had to be before the beginning based on the sense. Possibly. But you're thinking along the right lines, okay? I have tried to simplify this and I don't know that I can simplify it And that is, what is the pre-temporal existence of God? If this keeps you up at night, we need to talk, okay? This really shouldn't keep you up at night, but it's something that keeps... So, you're thinking, Natalie? It doesn't keep me up at night. <laughs> Good! Good. Good. Some people are just thinking, we never even have heard or thought of that to this point, so... And that's, and that's the thing, is that the more that I move to, to towards a biblical worldview, the more that I have to deal with a pretemporal existence of God before creation. Okay? Follow what I'm trying to say? Am I losing this? Were we not taught that, though? What do you mean? Explain. When I was taught that God always was here. He was yeah. before... Okay. We talked about that whenever I came. Mean, yeah. Ask that camp. Yeah. If God created it, was God here before? And the answer is yes, mostly. And that's a good question. Okay. And I mean, I'm not saying we have proof for that, but that's just that goes back to our whole belief system because some of us were just take things as that's what we were taught, so it's always that way. Right. It's that belief, like Alan right. said. Right. Right. Versus the other. And so, and so in dealing with the pretemporal existence of God, in other words, that moment, and it's hard for us to deal with this, but there's a moment before time that God possibly exists. This is deep philosophy stuff, okay? Um... Here's, here's the three things is, as so we think about pretemporal existence. Um, and pretemporal existence, I really do think it, it weighs into how it is that we evaluate our worldview. I don't know if that's a great big deal, but it does weigh into how we evaluate our worldview. And that is, at the moment that God, follow me out, 
at the moment that God existed. He caused the universe. That is one option, okay? That we do not have the universe starting, and but the moment that God, oh, I'm God, oh, here's creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Is God causal, okay? Is it necessarily causal, which is a philosophy question that I don't have great answers to. I just know that it's a question that's asked about pretemporal God. Is it a one, two, three, or a sequential idea? Is that God existed then created the universe? Kind of what you were articulating a little bit ago is that there's a sequential aspect to our pretemporal understanding of God. Um, and then the simultaneous view that the ends, okay, it's simultaneous. Okay, first one is that God existed, then he caused the universe. Second one, God existed and then created the universe. It's subtle, but most, most people on a secular worldview won't have too much problem with intelligent design when they get here that there's some kind of essential cause. Here's why. We have the Big Bang, which is essentially there was nothing, and then it exploded. Now, I have coined my own axiom because I can't find it anywhere. For nothing to exist, it has to exist in something. <laughs> have you ever thought about this? For nothing to exist, it has to exist in something. You can't have nothing that explodes. What, what do you think, Donna? Basically, what I always did. Okay. What was there to explode? What was there to be the big bang? Right. So I have one, two, three, four dollars in my billfold. I have to have something to have nothing in. When you ask somebody who's trying to prove neo-Darwinistic theory or worldview or big bang, ask them this question, what does that nothing exist in? <laughs> you might just blow their mind the way the Big Bang exploded. <laughs> just something to chew on, okay? I don't know if it's right. Anyway, that's Watson's axiom that I've coined over the last um, two months. Uh, and I've asked a good friend not to steal that from me. <laughs> so you can't have nothing that explodes if nothing can't exist in, in if nothing has to exist in something. Um, and then this idea is that God simultaneously existed and then caused the universe. Now, what does this matter? Here's the question. Here's the best answer for Big Bang, okay? We have lots of biblical answers, but I want to stay on this side of the board for just a moment. Neo-Darwinistic theory is having some great big issues because it says that, like down here where our purpose was in that first set of questions, it's all about me. <laughs> a secular worldview says that I started as a thing in the water that looked like a fish that finally grew arms and legs, and walked up out of the water. After 150 years of Darwinistic theory, the evidences of this happening are getting astronomically small. 
there's so much evidence that says there's no way that this happened. What are we left with? And on the secular worldview side, without bringing the Bible into it, is this thing called intelligent design. And that is, is that if I find, if I find some kind of, if I find some kind of information encoded in the world around me, how did it get there? Okay. One of the, one of the biggest things about, here, how do you move, how do you move from evolution, how do you move from evolution is that if you had a hundred monkeys in a room with a typewriter and unlimited sheets of paper, and all they're doing is just randomly typing, that on one day, if all the conditions were correct, they would come up with Tolstoy's War and Peace. <laughs> That's what evolution proposes, is that given enough time, the impossible will eventually happen. Uh, Renee and I are debating today whether or not given enough time that the Dolphins will win a football game. <laughs> they had one perfect season and that was all. I know, right? <laughs> now, on this secular worldview, moving away from the Big Bang and into, into intelligent design, you would think, oh, hey, this gets us really close to here, doesn't it? Can I throw out what they're doing? Has anybody seen the movie? Sorry, I have to say it. Prometheus. Have you seen Prometheus? You've missed one of the alien movies on Prometheus. Uh, <laughs> the opening to the movie Prometheus <clears throat> is that there is a spaceship that crashes into the Earth. This humanoid looking thing gets out falls into the water is dissolved and that's what has created evolution to crawl up out of the water is that his DNA it's a sci-fi movie they're trying okay I've never heard of the movie I, you know what it's two hours of your life you won't get back trust me but intelligent design adds into this on the academic side. This concept of alien transpermia. I guarantee you flip to the sci-fi channel, you flip to the history channel, you will see this. Oh, aliens created us because they sent something through the atmosphere and into the water in which we sparked something and grew up out of the goo. Hi, Kermit. You've heard that? No. no. I said, hi, Kermit. <laughs> oh, hi, Kermit. It sounded like okay, it sounds like Kermit. Kermit gotcha. Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, no. I'm, I'm with you. I, that was very Kermit-ish in my Kermit voice. Um, I want to tell you, I'm going to ask you this question. Faith. How much faith does it take <laughs> to believe this is a good option? The same about amount that? that it takes to believe that one. I would say this takes or greater him. faith <laughs> than it does to create, to, to buy into creation. Just me. But this is the world we live in. And this is the world that is being told, and this is the stories that we're hearing in academia about how this thing is. Which brings me to section, finally, the last part of this section. I was thinking, ah, oh, we're ready for section number two, almost. I have a good friend who uh, called me up the other day. His oldest girl is in high school science. First line of the book.
Science is science. Faith is faith. They are not the same. Does that bother you? A little bit? What's it saying? You can't have both together. Is that bothersome? Bothersome. The division of worldviews is right at the beginning. And so when we consider this, we have to deal with this whole thing. Let's go into let's go into Genesis one one a little bit more. Genesis 1 1. Here it is. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now the earth was what? Formless and empty. What else do we have? Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. I would like to tell you that verse 2 is easy. <laughs> and verse 2 has caused more problems in my journey in biblical worldview, perhaps more than any other. And I want to see if we can we'll be able to deal with that next time. Um, Let's see if we can do this. So in the beginning, God created... What's the first thing he created? Let's take a look at that. The heavens. Love that. Let's see if we can find locations here. In the beginning, God created the heavens. What else did he create? In the, earth. the earth. Okay. Any problems so far? Here's what I was taught. I live on the earth, right? Anything above is <laughs> heavens, right? It's interesting. How do you have a heavens if it's the first thing created? Follow what I'm asking? other planets yet. They don't come in until day four. I don't follow what you're asking. Either. How can we have an above if we don't have a below to relate it to? So how is it above if we have nothing below? Well, we did. They're the not above. using the word above and below. Your teacher was from New York. It was using that word. <laughs> and this is where most of us stop in faith. <coughs> we have heavens. We have Okay, which is, which is really kind of interesting. Because if it's all at one time, I don't know that I have a problem with it. But the question is, is that the old question is what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Why does it matter? Ooh, why does it matter? Well, you said this is where we stop with our faith. I mean, I don't understand what you're saying. Okay. For us to find Jesus, does it matter how well we define these terms? Probably not. <laughs> okay. But the more that I come this way, the more separation I find in these two things and in a couple more things here in verse 2. See if I can do this well. May start laying out this case. We have, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless. 
empty. What else do we have? Darkness. <clears throat> and we have water. And somehow the Spirit of God was over this, hovering over this thing called water. Let's go to, where do I want to go? Let's go to Psalm 33. Let's go to Psalm 33. Where I'm about ready to go with this is wherever you're at on the biblical spectrum of this biblical worldview, okay, there will be people that will say, oh, Psalm 33 is story, or Psalm 33 is absolute truth. Psalm 33, um, verse 6. By the word of the Lord, what happened? The heavens were made. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. The starry host by the breath of his mouth. What does that sound like if we start starry host by the breath of his mouth? What's a starry host? The night sky, the stars are in the sky. Angels. She wants to go there. What did you say? Angels. Heavenly hosts. Yeah. Well, if it was by the breath of his mouth, does that mean that he spoke them into existence? Or breathed life into them? Winter, winter, chicken dinner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's see if we can put this together. Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens are made, the starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea crazy thing into jars that's weird um, and he puts what the deep the deep is into storehouses Yeah, into a heap, into jars. I'm okay with that. Um, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it did what? Stood firm. Stood firm. I want to lay this out. That as we take a look at Psalm 33, verse 6. Uh, let's go to, let's go to Psalm 107, verse 24. Sticking in Psalms, I'm just kind of, I got a great big list over here that I'm not exhausting. Uh-oh. Psalm 107, 24, sorry. Psalm 107, 24. Others went out, and let's pick up verse 23. Others went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord 
and what? His wonderful deeds in the deep. Interesting thing. Um, for he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted what? What do waves sound like? Water. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. Now, I think that this thing here, verse 26, grammatically is really talking about the waves, not about these guys in the sea. You can make your case both ways, but it seems to, I'll see if we can apply this to the waves. That the waves mounted up to the heavens and they went down to the deep. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Um, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he brought them out of their distress and he stilled the storm to a whisper. You remember a time in the New Testament where the storm was stilled to a whisper? When do we see that? Jesus on the boat. He says, He says, Peace. What? Be still. It's interesting talking about water because uh, we're running out of time. Um, Donna, have you ever been on a cruise where the water and the storm got pretty uh, exciting? Maybe a little bit. <laughs> well, I mean, not really. Okay. Not like, not like what some people have experienced. Not like what some people have experienced, right? But water out on the seas can be a pretty scary thing and a pretty chaotic thing. What I want to lay the case for here in Genesis 1.1 is that as we try to put this together, there is something here about these four places. Heavens, earth, the dark, the deep, um, and this thing called water where the, the Spirit of God was hovering over. Uh, what happens is, let's see if we can do this real quick. Water has a tendency in Scripture to be rather chaotic. We have a storm with Jesus in a boat, and he says, Peace, be still. We have a group of, Egy of, of, of Israelites leaving Egypt, <laughs> and the water is preventing them from escaping, and what does God do? Well, he parts the water, but then he crashes it over him, right? It's interesting that in this chaos that God is the one throughout Scripture in this imagery of water is somehow stilling the chaos. Uh, let's see if we can do one last thing. Let's go to Genesis chapter 7. This will be the last one we take a look at. This is, this is in the flood account. Um, in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11... In the six hundred year, in the six hundredth year of Noah's life, on the seventeenth day of the second month, on that day, what happened? All these springs yep. Of the great deep <clears throat> springs of the deep. They did what? Burst. Broke forth. And the floodgates of the heaven were opened, and rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Now here's the interesting thing. 
best way that I can put this into context. When I take a look at what I would call the story side of creation from Psalms, the imagery matches. I think we have heavens, I think we have earth, I think we have this darkness, this place that we don't really know much about and we can take a look at that more in the, in the future. We have this water being contained in jars and wherever you sell it, piled up in heaps. We have things breaking forth from the bottom. We have things falling from the top. There's a whole bunch of chaos going on. And I think at the end of the day, as we end up with this creation day one in Genesis, uh, this, this fundamental creation, that there's more here than what I think we even understand, and what I at least I understand to go delve into. Um, I know this much. I have list after list after list after list after list of scriptures all throughout the Old Testament talking about the deep, the darkness, this heavens and earth kind of thing. Um, there is a bunch of crazy in scripture in dealing with this whole thing. And then from here, we get into light. Um, we will deal with light next week. Let me I stop here. Any questions about anything that I've kind of chatted about tonight? Something that sparked a question? or mm -hmm. thing I always chew on is that he created the heavens, not heaven. He created the heavens. <laughs> yeah. I chew on that for a while. Interesting, there's a plurality to it. And get nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, here's the interesting thing is that with heavens being plural and earth being singular I think this is what we have a hard time conceptually in English processing is that this whole idea of heavens I think it's okay to stop with okay it's everything above okay I don't have a problem with an empty universe with the earth somewhere in it <laughs> at the but before light even comes into play. I want us to grasp the chaoticness of this, and I also think that heavens has a spiritual aspect to it as well. I have I have probably narrowed my belief system probably too much. Um in saying that this is the spiritual world and this is matter. Very simply because this is a plurality of things. And that's a scary, weird place. But I think so many times in our teaching of worldview and of teaching of trying to come this way, do we include the spiritual realm here? here? Well, we have two concepts of heaven. We do. The heavens, which yeah. are, we consider above, and heaven... The place of eternity. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. It's an interesting worldview question. And there may be times that you walk out of here with more questions than I got answers for. And maybe sometimes it's just going to force you into Scripture. I really do believe that. When you start following those questions out, it, it drives, it's always driven me this way. I'd like to tell you different. <laughs> but good stuff. Good stuff. Hey, let me pray. We'll be, we'll be done, and we will take a look at this thing called light next week. Father God, I thank you so much for your goodness. I thank you so much for who it is that you are. and I thank you for just a few moments that we get to consider uh, what our worldview may be. Um, Father, I pray above all things that you'd give, you'd give us the mind of Christ, that you would, through training and teaching, increase our faith that we do not have to live like the rest of men with no hope, but we can depend on your word being real and uh, help us to really help us to really process uh, our worldview and drive us into submission to what your Bible teaches, um, but do it with evidence and do it with logic and do it with some intentionality. Thank you for this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.